since people stopped wandering the plains and began putting down roots to farm, there have been problems. See, civilization, for all its neat gadgets and written history, created a new concept that threatens survival to this very day. Crime. It's no coincidence that possession is nine-tenths of the law. Once humans began settling into permanent locations, moving became a lot harder, and the things at that particular place became precious. When your bean field's having an off year while the neighbor's swimming in Lima, it's only logical that you take his access to feed your unfortunate bean-eating family. And when that neighbor complains about the theft, someone tells you not to do that anymore or beats you up. Welcome to law. However, what if those people that enforce the law aren't doing the best they can for everyone because of overwhelming crime rates? Let's say there was a whole bunch of bad bean crops, or more likely, an area with high poverty rates already experiences economic crisis. More crimes, not more enforcement, equals deterioration of the area. It's Urban Decay 101. It's not all bad, though. Citizens not ordained as enforcers of justice have stepped up throughout history, taking matters of law into their own hands for the betterment of the community, usually in an Old West environment. We call these people vigilantes, and they've been talked about on the show before. This time, we're not delving into the world of Batman or Kick-Ass vs. the Mob again. There are many ways to spin injustice, such as social injustice, where social components act to suppress each individual within it, creating that desperation that so feeds this film's vibe. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself now. What are we talking about today? Fight Club. Based off of the book by Chuck Palahniuk, this intense experience from 1999 talks about issues facing everyone in modern society, while making lewd jabs that leaves the audience uncomfortable for the whole runtime. It left its mark, for better or worse, on cinematic history. So, what can sociology glean from this endeavor? Before we start, though, got some housekeeping to do. The internet joke checklist, because <laughs> this is hardly the first time Fight Club's been reviewed. Alright, what to avoid? First, no making fun of Fight Club's rules. Check. Second, no making fun of Fight Club's rules. Oh, that was quick. Let's get started. Meet the narrator, a late 20s man lackadaisically charging into his 30s that has a problem with insomnia. This small issue becomes the inspiration for the events to follow, because something is fundamentally wrong if a person cannot sleep. That's a running theme throughout this film, too. Some basic function is malfunctioning, which upends everyone's world and turns life into a shell of what it should be. All started by lack of a good night's sleep. If only he'd bought a memory foam pad, things might have turned out very differently. He supplements his sleepless nights with visits to support groups for terminal or lifelong conditions, such as testicular cancer or brain parasites, and silently watches as they pour their pain out over him, sobbing, hoping, hurting. This story loves to leave you unsettled, but that's any Chuck Palahniuk story. And like his good ones, this bizarre situation serves to illustrate a larger point. The narrator has no connection with himself or any of his co-workers, living in isolation and miserable in his sleepless condition. These fleeting moments of bonding with strangers over a pain so overwhelmingly deep that it feels like dying, that gives him the outlet he needs to break free of the ennui that traps him in this sleepless stupor. At least for a night. His only recourse against the forces that drive his life into the ground is to ball with strangers. Which sounds pathetic, but consider his job. Look! You want me to deprioritize my current reports yeah. until you advise him a status upgrade? Make these your primary action items. Here's your flight coupons. Call me from the road if there's any snags. And it's that kind of compassion that really drove me to seek out office work. <laughs> Explains my whole day as a temp. Socio! Sir, sir, sir. It's so loud. Um, did you want to see me? I have some questions for you. What did I do wrong? Why does it have to be a bad thing? That's, that's a negative attitude we don't want in the workplace. No, I just want your feedback on some of these questions. Okay. First. Do you really think that shirt and vest are appropriate attire for this workplace? I always wear these clothes. Have you read the policies? This is, uh, the only thing I own. Fair enough. Second, are you aware that you're taking more than your allotted daily share from the water cooler? Really? May as well confess, we've got security footage to back us up. Ah, oh, memories. The narrator has a complication arise with his support group therapy, and eventually finds a friend named Tyler Durden that opens his eyes to the travesty that is our modern world. After expressing that the country has become engrossed in collecting commodities instead of making real achievements as individuals, he starts Fight Club with the narrator. Two guys beating the hell out of each other in a parking lot. Now that's progress. No, really. 
Up until this point, the narrator felt totally powerless to make any changes in his life. He just kept his head down at work, bought what was trendy with the excess funds that weren't going toward bills, and cried himself to sleep at night with dying strangers. <laughs> Fight Club, as brutal and dumb as it is, was the first choice he made as an adult to do something other than just exist as a gear in the social structure. What harm could come from that? You are not your job! Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Let's get back to Fight Club. Other restless souls, men who have all lost their way and need to find something concrete to bust their heads against, join Tyler and the narrator in fighting, until eventually it's happening every night of the week. Each man feels a sense of self-justice when they enter that ring and trounce an opponent, or feel a need to really improve themselves when they end up beaten and panting on the pavement. It's motivation at an individual level to be a better fighter, an analog for improving one's own condition in life. So what's to stop these men from pursuing their own career paths and advancing in their own merits? Well, Fight Club, Reverend Durden has the floor on that one. We have no great war, no great depression. Our great war is a spiritual war. Our great depression is our lives. all been raised on television to believe that one day we'd all be millionaires and movie gods and rock stars, but we won't. Statistically, he's right. There's only so many higher level positions for everyone to aim for, but the problem is his own sense of justice is starting to override everyone else's there. He's subverting their choices and decisions with his opinion, and they're listening to him because he's the one that organized this thing that they all like. The popularity contest is turning into a brainwashing seminar, and it only gets worse with Project Mayhem, aka Total Chaos. Why settle for merely preaching against the conventions of society when instead you can attack them directly by messing with antennae, erasing tapes at rental stores, wow, half these terrorism acts are really dated, flipping spike strips, and destroying corporate logos. What's happened here is Tyler Durden has lost his mind and thinks that his vision of the world is the only one that matters. Yeah, he's become the same problem the narrator fought against with this man making decisions for him. Which makes the narrator his own worst enemy. Okay, who doesn't know that at this point? This is like Kaiser Sose or Citizen Kane's sled. Everyone knows it. But, in case you're one of the seven that don't, I'll go ahead and warn you. I might be spoiling a major twist if you haven't seen this yet. Brace yourself! Tyler Durden is the creation of the narrator's mind, another personality that drives Project Mayhem and makes decisions that get people killed. Even if you don't know that going in, there are several dozen signs that it's happening throughout the movie. However, I'm no expert in these multiple minds having the same mouth thing, so let's go to the master in split personalities. <sighs> Alright guys, we'll do this one last time, alright? These are the dice, alright? This is a success. This is a crit and a success. If you roll one of these, it's no longer a crit and a success, it's just a crit. What? what? This is a crit and a failure. If you roll one of these, then it's just a critical failure, not a failure. You following along with me? Oh. Alrighty then. Now, if you roll more of these than more of these, then it's success. If you roll more of these, then it's a wash. And this, well, this is just Prince's new name. Any questions? Are we all going to have to buy these new dice? No, Bacchus, we're just going to assume you always fail and move on from there. Hey, DM. Feels like forever since I've seen you. It has been. I actually recently auctioned off your seat because you have not been showing up. Made so much money off that. All gold doubloons. Real good ones, too. So much... Ow. Who'd you sell it to? Arr, I agree with Bacchus. New dice on a pirate's salary is breaking me budget. Wait, you're salaried? Pirates Union comes through when you're landlocked, so yeah. Really? The, the terrible pirate? At least he shows up! Mm, you got me there. So, care to talk about Tyler Durden? There's really nothing that I can tell you that isn't already old news, or hasn't already been said before. This is not rocket science here. People have analyzed this movie to death, and now you're throwing your hat into the ring on this? Tell me how terribly the Tyler Durden narrator split is done. Yes! Well, surprising the first time around, for you, the way the film portrays Tyler Durden and the reveal of his identity is totally unbelievable. Here are the ways. One, he doesn't have any form of identification that, you know, you have to use on a daily basis, especially to get a job. 
Two, if the narrator doesn't think he's Tyler, who does he think of himself as? Well, the film uses the naming for support groups technique, you know, different name for different groups, to keep the name well hidden from the audience without them really thinking about it. As a twist technique, it's great. But from a reality standpoint, not so much. I mean, how does somebody working a full-time job, in an office cubicle no less, forget their own name? I mean, look at this example. Hello, Peter. Hello, Peter. Peter, what's happening? Let's not forget office emails. Memos, staffing lists, organization charts. Okay, so not knowing your own name is pretty impossible unless you're an unemployed hermit with amnesia. And no written record. What if I told you that in the book, Tyler Durden is an alias the main character made separate from his public identity that he was unaware of because he was delusional when he made it? Then it... Actually, that would have solved a lot of issues. Why didn't they do that in the movie? Filmmakers can't resist a good twist. Thanks for nitpicking on QDM. Anytime. It's really more of a Twitch reflex at this point. So where was I? Can I be a buccaneer? I told you in this game they're called scoundrels. I want a galleon brimming with Spanish bullion. I want one of those too. That sounds great. Oh, great. Now I've got two of them. So, Tyler is the offspring of every ugly thought the narrators ever had, including this lovely bit of post-apocalyptic madness. In the world I see, you're stalking out through the damp canyon forest around the ruins of Rockefeller Center. You'll wear leather clothes that will last you the rest of your life. You'll climb the wrist thick cuts of vines that wrap the Sears Tower. Very played down in the film, but the book is very clear. Tyler Durden's ultimate goal is the total destruction of civilization. This maddening pressure that created him, he wants undone. Society totally wiped off the face of the earth and people struggling for basic survival. That's, that's clearly what Project Mayhem is trying to do. It's trying to create this social disorder which leads to dysfunction, which leads to dystopia. The maddening part is how many people joined him in this effort. Willingly. Even the person that created this personality can't stomach Tyler's vision and does everything in his power to keep these master plans from coming to fruition. So overall, the second half of this movie forgets the rest of the world exists, which is ultimately the problem with self-justice. It's masturbation. Now, social justice, that's for next time. Fight Club is a completely unique experience, despite its mixed message of self-improvement through destruction. You know, Catch-22, good with the bad, I guess. But if you haven't checked it out yet, you should, because that's your homework assignment for this week. I'm The Other Socio, and I am Jack Sinoff. I've got two of them now. You got two of those? Perfect! One for each of us! Half half power, guy! Get away from me! Gordon Zola. <laughs> those would be two hard voices to go between. They sure is!